Oh, I love a good parade. I love a good parade. I just thought I would just take a second and remember the really good parades in our lives. Are there, are there names of parades that you absolutely love or used to love as a kid or in your years gone by? The Santa Claus Parade. Here? Where? Here. Anybody else? Sorry? Traveler's Day Parade. Wow. Great Cup Parade. Great Cup Parade. Stampede Parade. Pride Parade, Molly Moore says. Canada Day. Canada Day. Is there a parade on Canada Day? Oh, the cool people have a parade on Canada Day. I, uh, my childhood. Cora, did you ever go to the Annapolis Valley Apple Blossom Parade? Oh, boy, I stood in the heat in New Minus, Nova Scotia, for the Apple Blossom Parade. You're a great parade. Lots of Shriners on little bikes. And, and the clangy Turkish thing. Right? Makes a good parade. Oh, I love a good parade. Couple of things about this parade. And I gotta tell you, I've been preaching this text for like 21 years, and I'm still discovering new things. A donkey wasn't a lowly animal for Jesus to come into Jerusalem on. Newsflash. Horses were only ever ridden by kings on their way to war. All the rest of the time, kings in first century Palestine rode donkeys. That was the animal of choice for kings to ride on. So actually, if you think of it this way, Jesus, who walked his whole life everywhere, uh, step up on the donkey, right? It was a step up for him to come in on a donkey and was him placing himself as a king. Uh, horses were for a whole other type of business. So kings greeting their people would always be on a donkey. So here comes Jesus, the prince of peace, on a donkey, which is the animal of kingly peace, not war. And in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, there's four different accounts right of this. It's a donkey and her colt. There's two. Okay? And this is a crazy thing from Zephaniah. It's quoted by Matthew. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming you to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then in Matthew it says, so they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them. And he sat on them. Both of them? What's that look like? Like, I should have gotten two stools. I could have showed, showed you what. How do you ride a colt and a dunk? Anyway, Matthew totally missed Zephaniah's poetic influence, and, and it's just really an expression of, and on a colt, like, like, yeah, really, a donkey, a colt. Like, that's what Jesus did. Anyway, that's a little thing. You can look about, you can ponder that deep spirit mystery thing about the two things, and how do you ride them? Maybe he went halfway on one, and halfway on the other. Who knows? And I know those of you who've got Maybe the donkey. Well, I think that's why the, we were always taught there was a colt because they never left their mom when they were nursing, right? So they had to come together. But the question is, did they ride? Anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave that for you. You can talk about it at lunch or later at work this week. You know, I, started, I just think it would be great at work, you know, in the lunchroom or whatever. You're like, you know, I've been thinking about how Jesus might have ridden both a colt and, a, and your coworkers would be just like, i got to get me to that church. Just saying, they might. Or, or they might not. Uh, other thing, for those of you who've memorized Scripture, I know that's most of you, uh, I know you're going to tell me in the Gospel of Matthew are there are no palms. There are no palms mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. It's just branches, right? But Branch Sunday sounds really silly. There's not a holy day called Branch Sunday. So it's Palm Sunday, so we got palms, and that's just the way we're going to go. People, this is a classic entrance for a king. The people of a town, a village, a city would come out when a king returned from traveling, from their summer house or whatever. They'd come out of the city and usher the king in and shout words of acclamation. And so, oh, that just reminds me how great thou art. And when he comes with shouts of acclamation. Yeah, I've always wondered what that was going to be like. So here are these shouts of acclamation. They are shouts of claiming. Hosanna, which means save us in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, Hosanna in Hebrew means uh, save us. But by the time it gets to Matthew, 180 years after uh, Jesus has left us, um, Hosanna really has just come to be an acclamation for the one who will save us. So it becomes almost a title. And that's how we've used it in our hymns and stuff. Hosanna, right? 
Hosanna is Savior and save us, both at the same time. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These are shouts of acclamation, shouts of claiming. The babies even got into it. Do you like that about Matthew? Jesus says, it says the babies and the children even got into it. And then Jesus says, have you not heard? Because, of course, the old people complained. Oh, the babies are shouting. And he says, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. That's Psalm 8. Matthew always has Jesus quoting Psalms and Scripture. Psalm 8. Out of the mouths of infants. I thought, is that the first time out of the mouths of babes was ever used? I never put that together before. Out of the mouths, well, out of the mouths of babes. Right? We say that. There it is, right there in Psalm 8. Later, Jesus in Jerusalem. Out of the mouths of babes. And I just was reminded when Rena was reading the turmoil. Remember the Greek word? Remember, you all know this. The Greek word for uh, turmoil is seismo, which is where we get the word seismic from, right? And so when it says in Jerusalem and all the city was in turmoil, it really means shaken, earthquakey, flipped, right? So there's the seismo, and then there's the actually flipping of the tables. I think they kind of go together as a nice little envelope. You could just take that. That's another good one for Thursday at work. Oh, I was thinking about that Greek word seismo and how the whole city was in such turmoil, it was like it was trembling for what was going to happen. Let me tell you, the authorities were trembling. What is it we are claiming about Jesus when we shout, Hosanna? When we shout, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, son of David. What is it we are claiming? That's what this week is about. we got to get this straight in our hearts. What are we claiming about Jesus? And by those of us who are claiming it, what are we saying about ourselves? I've said it before. I can never leave it alone on Palm Sunday. There were, we believe, two parades that day or within a day of each other. Uh, the second parade was happening on the other side of town, on the fancy gates, the empire gates. Uh, the other par parade was Pontius Pilate arriving for Passover. Because Passover is the Hebrew story of salvation. It's the singular most important story where God saves the people, uh, the Jewish people, from slavery in Egypt. And so at the celebration of Passover, which Jesus has come to Jerusalem to celebrate, Pilate and the Romans always beefed up their forces. Because if there's going to be an uprising or a rebellion in Jerusalem in first century Palestine, it's going to happen during Passover because the people are all filled with that good stuff, that good sal salvation history story of God. And so Pontius Pilate knows that, and he loved to put down uprisings. There's awful, bloody history of Pilate, just in case you believe the David Bowie image of Pilate, like he was so pleasant and philosophical. He was a mass murderer as well. And he put down one or two uprisings over the years. So Pontius Pilate's coming into Jerusalem to secure it during Passover. And it's a different kind of parade, right? It's got horses, lots of them. It's got chariots. It's got all that stuff you saw in the old movies, like Spartacus. It's the dudes with helmets and spears, and they're, and they're marching. It's all about empire. There's golden eagles on the fronts of things, you know? It's totally empire. It's meant to threaten. It's a parade that's meant to uh, inspire fear and concern in the rank-and-file people of, pa of uh, Jerusalem who were there for Passover. They're just coming to celebrate their most important holiday, most important celebration, religious day, uh, day seven of them, and uh, Pilate wants to make sure, yeah, you stick to the plan. You just stick to the plan. And so on that side of town, you have empire coming in on our side of town where we'd be hanging, yelling Hosanna. You have the Prince of Peace coming. And he comes in, and he turns over the tables, and then what does he get down to doing right away? In the, temp in the temple, healing. Jesus comes and they bring people to him in the temple. Never happened before. And there was healing. So the Prince of Peace comes and he does the exact opposite of empire and control and power and threat. He loves and he heals and he blesses and he treats everyone equally like they're all loved children of God. Ooh, the Romans hate that kind of stuff. So this week, folks, what we got to think about is this. Can we sing Hosanna and acknowledge that this Lord, this King, is about a kingdom that we may not necessarily be comfortable with? This is the week of really wrestling with our discomfort 
about what this kingdom of shalom, this kingdom of wholeness, is actually going to look like. A kingdom that's not about power. It's not about Christians feeling good about ourselves or being in control or being the better religion than some other or anything like that. All that stuff smells like Rome, folks. And it's been all over us for centuries. Time to get rid of it this week. We're going to get rid of it. Because the king who came that we sing and we bravely wave our branches and we teach our little kids about was about none of that stuff. Not about who's in and who's out and who's better than, who's got power and who doesn't got power. Jesus was about shalom and wholeness and walking in a new way that includes everyone, justice, hope for the downtrod, land for the landless, release to the captives. I love those verses in what is a very beautiful, fun hymn. Land for the landless, release to the captives, justice for the downtrod. That's what this parade is about. So we can sing bravely, but we also must transform our praise into commitment. We must transform our praise into walking a new path. Because Jesus isn't going to do it alone. I don't know what you've heard about miraculous comings again and supernatural power and all that kind of stuff. It's a beautiful dream, but it kind of lets us off the hook. Jesus is not going to do this alone. We are part of the action. We are part of of the promise. We are like the activity of the promise here and now. So I hope this week that you will fall open. I hope that you'll fall open. I hope that your hearts will break open. And your heart will change in your singing and in your praying. I hope you'll stand fast with me through the darkness of Thursday and Friday because the great promise is coming. There is something marvelous, something beautiful coming, and we are all called together. May it be so. Amen.